<clears throat> All right. Well, let's get started. How y'all doing tonight? Yeah. Right, good? We're ready to get going. Amen? Yeah. All right. All right. <clears throat> well, we need to finish up a little bit with what we were talking about today. There's another part concerning healing and the anointing and things like that that we were discussing. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Judges. We're going to go to Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13. Now there is, there is a lot about healing that obviously we couldn't just get right into, little details here and there, things like that. But most of the details I learned by doing. And as you do, you'll learn those details even if I don't tell them to you, right? Some of it, some of the details, if I told you, it wouldn't make much sense to you right now anyway. So we're going to go through this, finish it up. And there's a couple of little points, things that we're going to tie things together. And then we're going to get to the ministry part. All right? Now, Judges chapter 13. Now, we're going to be at the very... I should have said Judges 14 because we're at the last verse of uh, 13. But before, while you're looking for that, and I'm going to give you another scripture. You don't have to go there. I'm just going to quote it to you. But I want you to be thinking about it. Remember, I have made several statements about you not having authority. Remember that? I've said those things. I know that kind of sticks with people. And we talked about a policeman, the man, the policeman, the actual man, the person, the name other than policeman doesn't have authority. It's the fact that he acts as the representative of the state or the city that gives him authority. All right? Now, Jesus said, but, but I want to emphasize this because I want you to understand the devil doesn't have authority either. Okay? Now, Matthew 28, don't have to turn there, because I want you to stay in Judges, we're going to be there in a minute. But in Matthew 28, it said that Jesus <clears throat> told them, All power in heaven and in earth has been given unto me. Therefore, in my, therefore you go in my name. Isn't that right? Now, notice he said that word power is the Greek word exousia, and it means authority. Right? So he, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. To Jesus. Right? Yes. Now, remember I told you there's several words that Christians can't believe, or generally don't believe. One of them was the word all. Right? Now, does all mean all or does it mean some? All. So, if I said, if we poured out a bunch of pennies up here, and I said, now these are all the pennies that we have, does that mean there's some more pennies out there somewhere? No. Can there even be one penny out there? No. Why? Because it's all, right? Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Jesus said, all power slash authority, all authority has been given unto me. Isn't that right? All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Now, does that mean that there is any authority anywhere else? No. Right? If it does, it's not all. Right? So all means all. I know I keep repeating that, but for some reason, Christians have a hard time with the word all. They always read it to mean some. Now, if Jesus has all, all authority, then the devil can have none. That means you can't even give the devil some. Because you can't give what you ain't got. Right? Now, so you say, well, I, I thought I had authority. No, Jesus has all authority. Now, your authority, understand, well, again, let me say it right. The authority you walk in is not your authority. It is the authority of Jesus. Alright? I know this is very simple, but it's really profound when you think about it. 
Because if Jesus has all authority, then the devil can have none. Now, if you don't even have authority, you can't give it to the devil. Right? So even you couldn't give the devil authority. Now, you can't give a, a robber and a thief authority. <clears throat> you understand? He's already a criminal. If you gave him authority, that would make him legal, make him legitimate. So you say, well, then how do we have the authority to do this? Well, the authority you exercise is not yours. Or, if it was, that means that you could go out there and, I, for instance, me, or you just put your name in there, but you could say, in the name of Curry Blake, I command this devil to leave. Isn't it right? If I have authority, why can't I use my name? Right? Now, we know that we can't use our name and make a devil run. Right? What name do we have to use? Jesus. So the authority is in the name of Jesus. So Jesus has the authority. He has all authority. That's what he said, right? Now, here's the problem. Whenever Jesus said all authority... You notice he didn't say, I give you authority there. Now, he gave his disciples authority in Luke chapter 10. Right? To exer That was delegated because it was temporary and it was for a specific purpose, a spe specific time. But you notice later he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Right? He didn't say... I give you authority. He didn't say that then. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore you go. That means you go in my authority, not you go in your authority. Yeah. See, you think I'm taking something away from you. But in a minute, if you get a hold of it, you're going to realize how much more you got. Because if you... Here's the problem. If you have authority then you're going to have a... The, the, the way the enemy is going to work on you is he's going to convince you that you only have a limited amount of authority. And he's going to tell you, you don't have authority to do this. You have authority to do that, maybe, but not authority to do this. And he's going to tell you, well, how do you know Jesus didn't revoke your authority? Do you know, because you sinned. You messed up. Well, when you mess up, he just takes that authority away from you. You see, isn't that the way people think? Well, I've sinned, so I don't have any authority. Well, you didn't have any authority before you sinned. <laughs> All right? <laughs> That's why I'm trying to get across to you. It's not your authority. If Jesus has all, then you have none. But the good news is the devil has none. Then you say, how do we tell the devil to leave then? Or how do we tell sickness to go? Not in your authority. Not in your faith. You understand? It's not about you. It is His name. You use His name. Now, the, the beauty of this is, is this. We are joint heirs with Him. That means everything He's got, we got. Right? And that doesn't mean that it was divided equally amongst all of us. That means, basically, whoever gets to the bank account first gets to empty it. Okay? I know that's a real natural way of thinking, but I'm just trying to help you out. Okay? What that means is everybody has equal access to everything. So the, the faster you get your mind off you and you realize that it's his authority, you're operating in his authority, that means you're not operating in a limited authority. You're not operating in a part of his authority. In other words, every bit of the authority that Jesus has, you can bring to bear against any situation. You understand that? So it's not about, well, I, you know, I don't know how much authority I got because, you know, I hadn't been all that faithful. I hadn't been all that right. I, no, it's not about that. You have as much authority to use as you can believe. Right? Jesus has not set your level of authority. Right? And what I mean by that is, he has not said you can have this much and you can have that much. Because he hadn't said anybody can have any. He says, I got it all. Now you take my name and you use as much of my authority as you need to do what I've told you to do. Which is to make disciples, cast out devils, heal the sick, raise the dead, feed the hungry, clothe the naked. Whatever needs to be done, you take as much of my authority and you use my name. You keep going back to the idea that I have to use See, you know you use Jesus' name. But you keep thinking it has something to do with you. 
and you think how much of Jesus' name or how much of Jesus' authority or the authority of God is able to be used through you is based on what you've done. If that's true, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? You get it? It's not by your works. Because if it's by your works, you're not going to praise Jesus. You're going to boast. This is what I did to get this power. But if you realize that it was Jesus saying, I have all authority, now you go. And at that point, you can use all of his authority. Any, any one of us or all of us can use his name to bring as much power to the situation as needed to remedy the situation. And I promise you, you're not going to bankrupt heaven. Amen? You're not going to bankrupt heaven. So don't worry about using heaven. Do you realize it's so funny how we think about God? We think here God has poured out everything, given everything freely and all that, and yet we think he's still hanging on and barely putting it out, and we've got to pull it out of him. You know, a lot of times we think of him like we do our earthly father. Dad, I need $25. Well, okay, here, here, here you go. You know, got to pull it out of him. And he's not like, God is more like the electric company. Think about it. He's more like, now, do you think the electric company gets mad when we turn on the air conditioner? No, they get happy. Isn't that right? They get excited. You know, they're thinking, why don't y'all put up some lights along the street, too? You know? You think they're concerned about how much power is flowing out? Not a bit. Matter of fact, the more power flowing out, the better they do. The more power going out, guess what? Their stock goes up. Isn't that right? They're not, they're not trying to hang on to it, dole it out a little bit at a time. They're saying, here, take it. Yeah, oh, yeah, plug in blow dryers, plug in, plug in televisions. You, know, you, need, you need to come out there and put in some more sockets for you? We'll line the walls. You understand what I'm saying? Man, if we just get an idea that God is like the electric company, and it's just saying, here, find different ways to use the power. Just find different, you know, different ways to get the power out. You know, come on, the, the electric company isn't more generous than God. Right? Now the beauty of it is, Jesus has already paid our bill. Right? You could even say, we got a tab. <laughs> That's how God is. You just got to get a different view of God. <clears throat> He's your Father. Your Heavenly Father. Maybe you didn't have a good relationship with your Father. Maybe that's part of the problem. I don't know. You know, maybe you look at your Heavenly Father like you do your earthly father and go, oh, no. You know? But that ain't the way He is. Amen? Now go with me to Judges. Chapter 13. <clears throat> I want to show you something. Now, we've mentioned before Jesus and people have brought up situations with Jesus. Talking about whenever He felt virtue leave Him. He felt the power come out of Him. And unfortunately, because it mentions that one time, everybody thinks that that's how it has to be every time. Right? All right. Just because something, usually when something's mentioned one time, that means that's unusual. Doesn't mean it's common. Right? Now, but I want to show you another aspect of it, and I'll prove it with Scripture right now. And this applies, so I'm going to show you both sides of this. So in Judges chapter 13, verse 24. It says, And the woman bare a son, and called his name Samson. And the child grew, and the Lord blessed him. Now, just stop there for just a second. I don't know where they got the name Samson, but if you look back up here, in verse 22, it says, And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die because we've seen God. Now you have to understand what's going on. Angel of the Lord appeared and he said, Oh, we're going to die because we've seen the Lord. And the woman said, Calm down. If he was going to kill us, he wouldn't have ate supper with us. And so we went, Okay, okay. But you realize Samson's father's name was Manoah. So why did they name him Samson? You would think his name would be Sam. Right? You'd think Sam's son's father's name would be Sam. Because it's Sam's son. Right? Okay, anyway. <laughs> See, I spend a lot of time on the road. It gives me time to think. Maybe too much time. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Tell you what, though. Doing research, it's, 
it's good because when I was doing research, I found out, you know, you always read about the stories about the men on each side of Jesus when he was crucified. And you read about, you know, murders, thieves, you hear, read different, you know, you read different places that said different things. And do, by doing research, I finally found out, do you know it tells us who at least one of those men were? Did you know that? Did you know that one of them was Paul's father? He said so himself. He said, my old man was crucified with Christ. Yeah. <laughs> I had you, you know. You, you know, you bought it. Okay. All right, anyway. <laughs> Just making you think a little bit, right? Okay. And the woman bare a son, called his name Samson. The child grew, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times. Hear that? The Spirit began to move him at times. And see, this is part of the problem. Historically, the church has been operating under what I would call the Samson anointing. It gets to move at times. Right? Oh, were you there last Sunday? No, what happened? Oh, man, you, oh, man the Spirit was moving. Woo! Ho, ho! It was good, man. I remember the last time it was like that. It was, what, was it, about December of 05? I mean, man, it was, oh, it was good. I'm, the Spirit, instead of operating under more like the David's anointing, because it said that whenever Samuel anointed David, it said, and the Spirit came upon him from that day forward. And they right. That's, he was symbolic of the church in the sense that the Spirit came upon us from that day forward. Are you ever without the Spirit? Why? Because I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that what he said? We just got to believe that. Now, he says, And the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtal. Now, we're, so we're talking about Samson, right? Now, move on over to chapter 16. Chapter 16. Starting in verse 1. Now, you know what happened with Samson, and it is amazing. I'm not going to get graphic tonight, but I want you to know, there is enough in the Bible to make people blush, if you really read it, all right? If they would really make it into a movie, you know, really in keeping with what it says, it'd probably be R-rated, you know, just on violence alone, all right? Because there was some pretty violent stuff going on there. But here in verse 1, it says, Then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a harlot and went in unto her. Now see, that, see, that's the thing. Samson is mentioned in Hebrews 11. Right? As a man of faith. And yet, see that's the thing about God. God doesn't get embarrassed. He will put all your secrets and all your sins in a book. And use you as an example. Alright? So that's just another good reason to stay clean. You know what I'm saying? Because if God doesn't do it, somebody else will. Amen? Somebody will write your life in a book. And it was told to the Gazites, saying, Samson has come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city. And were quiet all the night, saying, In the morning, when it's day, we shall kill him. And Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city, and the two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders, and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now notice, Delilah was not a harlot. Because most people read that and they read about a harlot and then they read about Delilah and they think, well, Delilah was a harlot. No, she wasn't. Jezebel. Well, technically she wasn't either, but could have been. Right? Basically, it talks about her in Revelation and her adulteries and all that kind of stuff. But do you realize here it says that Delilah was a, nut, was a woman, a different woman, different than the harlot, in the valley of Sorek. Now watch. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him. So apparently everybody knew he liked her. And said, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lies. Now you hear what he's saying? They're saying, listen, 
<clears throat> We've heard about this guy. We know him. He is a thorn in our side. So we want you, we know he likes you, so we want you to find out where does his strength come from. All right, now that tells us the first clue. That tells us that Samson did not look like Sylvester Stallone or Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Because you look at, you look at Sylvester Stallone, you don't go, wow, where does all that strength come from? Right? It's those 27-inch biceps. Right? You know where the strength comes from. So that means that Samson didn't look like Sylvester Stallone. When they looked at him, they said, how does he do that? Where is that strength coming from? He probably looked like Woody Allen. <laughs> Alright? Now, come on. You, now, you know, you know, if you saw Woody Allen rip the gates of a city off, you know your first question is going to be, where did he get that strength? Am I right? But you know, if you, I grew up in an era when they used to have some good Bible movies. Who was it? Used to, he played Samson one time? Or was it George Reeves or something? Way back. I'm talking back. Never mind how far back. But way back there. Okay? It ain't none of your business how far back. But, but remember, like they had movies like The Robe, Victor Mature, people like that. You know, people that really could act. And, and they had these people, Charlton Heston, another one. Oh, yeah. See, you look at, see, when you see, speaking of Charlton Heston, do you know, when you think Moses, you think Charlton Heston. Isn't that right? It doesn't matter. I don't care how many Ten Commandment movies or whatever else, it will always be Charlton Heston. Isn't that right? Always. Now, what's amazing, though, is that, you know, Charlton Heston wasn't the first one that tried out for that part. Do you know that? You know who tried out for it first? John Wayne. Now, can you picture John Wayne as Moses? Can you just... I mean, can you just picture him? I mean, come on. He played... Remember, he played a Mongol warrior at one time, and he grew the Fu Manchu mustache, and, and it was horrible, and he was no good. And then another movie he sang in... He, remember, he sang in one movie. That tells you something. All right? Okay. But you guys, I mean, think about it. Think of John Wayne as Moses. Can you just picture him? You know, you got Aaron, which is, what's his name? Uh, Carradine. John Carradine. He played Aaron, and he was kind of, he was good for the part, right? Can you picture John Wayne, though? I mean, because automatically he had that, that, that walk here. Well, I tell you what you're going to do, Pharaoh. You're, you're going to let my people go. Right? Okay. See. You know, that just didn't sit right. You know what I'm saying? That just didn't sit right. And you remember later, I mean, he made the Ten Commandments early on, right? And then later he makes Planet of the Apes. And you're sitting there watching him. And all these gorillas jump on him. And you're thinking, Moses? Somebody help Moses get those monkeys off of Moses. And you're thinking, Moses, where's your staff? The one you beat the Midianites with. Get them. You know? and, the, and they're just beating him up. And it just ain't right. You know what I mean? But he'll always be Moses. Right? And then you look at different people. Like, like I said, can you picture... Okay, when you picture Samson, I picture somebody like Stallone. Can you just see him? Yo, Delilah. <laughs> You know, you just picture him with that attitude that he had, right? But think about it. He was probably, like I said, more like Woody Allen. You know, you, can you just picture him? Uh, well, 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 Delilah. Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, can you? It just doesn't fit, you know? It's like, what would Delilah want with him? You know? So you start putting Bible characters in there. Um, who was the guy? Walter Brennan. Remember Walter Brennan? Now, if you're under about 50, you don't know who I'm talking about. No, I'm kidding. No. But Walter Brennan, see, when I read about Paul, I always pictured him like Walter Brennan. And back before I actually read the Bible, I figured, well, maybe he was like Walter Brennan. Remember, because Walter Brennan had that. And he would talk, remember the, the shows I remember him on? I could just picture his voice and what he had moved, and I could picture him as Paul talking to Timothy. Can you just see him? Getting over there. Timothy, flee! Flee, Timothy! Because he had that voice. 
I just picture him like that. But I think, okay, if this is Paul, then that must be his thorn in the flesh. Right? Now, I told you this before I thought about it, before I read. But So you go through all these things. And then I started thinking, you know, if God, what God really wanted was a Rambo. Isn't that right? That's what God wanted the church to be, is a Rambo. Remember? Man, kick the gate in, go in there with that big M60, you know, just kick the gate in. And just, you know, just... You know, just kill everybody and take names. You know what I'm saying? And instead, he gets Barney Fife. <laughs> you know, isn't it right? Instead of a Rambo, he gets a Barney Fife. The church is more like Barney Fife than Rambo. Right. right? We got our badge. We got our gun. One bullet. One bullet not in the gun. It's in the pocket. <laughs> and, and if we want to load our gun, we got to ask Andy. Uh. <laughs> isn't it right? And when we do get it loaded, we shoot ourselves in the foot. <laughs> but can you just see that? You know, because, I mean, if you get Barney Fife, I mean, that's not who you want. You know, we got to nip it in the bud. We got to nip it in the bud. You know, he, you, you don't want a Barney Fife coming to help you. Right? You want a Rambo. Amen? Now, you can tell I spend way too much time on the road just kind of thinking, all right? <laughs> Yeah, early on, you can tell I spent way too much time watching movies. It's the, the evidence of a misspent youth. Okay? But you got a picture. Samson was probably not big, wasn't impressive, and they didn't know where he was getting his strength. Right? So he says, they, they say to her, And see where in his great strength lies, and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him. See, afflict doesn't mean to make sick. It means to persecute. Okay? And we will give you, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein your great strength lies, and wherewith you mightest be bound to afflict thee. Okay, now point number one. Note to self. If a woman ever says, How can I tie you up to afflict you? Don't tell her. Okay? I told you, there's a lot in the Bible. Now, we could take this a whole different direction and we'd have to rate our CD or DVDs. Right? I mean, because obviously this is going in the direction that isn't normally what you would think of as church topics. Right? And he says here, watch this. In verse 7, And Samson said to her, If you bind me, with seven green whisks that were never dried, then shall I be, as, be weak and be as another man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green whisks which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now I'm just wondering what he's thinking while he's sitting there talking to her or whatever, and she's, you know, binding him. What are they talking about? What is he thinking? You know? Maybe it's good it's not recorded. All right? But I'm just saying there's some unusual stuff going on here. <clears throat> and then, now watch. And now there were men lying in wait and abiding with her in the chamber. Now apparently, Samson, I don't know, he might have been more like Stallone than we think. Or at least the Rocky characters and things that he plays. All right? Because he apparently wasn't the sharpest tack in the box. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Now, I don't care how big a room is. If I go into a room and there's men lying in wait and hiding, I don't think they could hide good enough that I couldn't see any of them. I think I would have some questions. Uh, Delilah, what's that guy doing over there behind that flower? You know? Because, I, I, you know, I just, I, when I read this, I put myself there. You know, I, and I, it's like I, I picture it based on what's read. And now watch, he says... There were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he broke the whisk as the bread of toe is broken when it touches the fire. So his strength was not known. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, you have mocked me. Now if that ain't the pot calling the kettle black, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> You've mocked me. Now, if I was him, I'd say, yeah, it's a good thing I did, too. You tied me up, and guys jumped out and tried to kill me. And then she comes back. Now watch. Behold, you've mocked me and told me lies. Now, and now tell me, I pray thee, wherein thou mightest be bound. She asked him again. 
and he tells her again. Now, you would think he's saying, okay, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me, or no, I'm sorry. fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Isn't that right? But here's what's going on with it. So here she says, now tell me how I can tie you up again. That's what she asked him, right? And he said to her, if you bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Delilah therefore took new ropes and bound him therewith and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars in wait abiding in the chamber, and he broke them from off his arms like a thread. Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto you have mocked me and told me lies. She's got guts. I'll, I'll give that to her. Okay. Tell me wherewith you mightest be bound. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head with the web. And she fastened it with the pin and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awaked out of his sleep. Well, that time he was laying down sleeping. And he went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. And she said unto him, How can you say I love you? When your heart is not with me. You have lied to me, you have mocked me these three times, and have not told me wherein your great strength lies. Now watch this. In this next verse, men, you need to study this next verse. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. This is called nagging. <laughs> she nagged him until... He, you men, don't nod. Don't, don't even make a move. But you know what I'm talking about. You know what it means to be vexed unto death. Amen? No, don't say amen. You get in trouble. You get a, you'll get an elbow in the, in the ribs. I pray. Okay. Now... That he told her all of his heart and said unto her, There has not come a razor upon mine head. Uh-oh. You notice every time he told the story, it got closer to the truth? Every time. For I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines. See, they'd already give up. She sent for him and saying, Come up this once, for he has told me, he has showed me all of his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. And she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man. Now, there's a lot to learn from this story. And we're going to give you a few points here in just a minute. But now, no, she, he's asleep. She calls for a man. Now, that would have woke me up. <laughs> right? Right then. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. Now, they didn't have razors and real scissors, you know, things. They had to use a sharpened blade. Now, he slept through that. Now, I don't know how he did it. But he slept through that. And it said, now watch. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, Now watch, this is important. I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. Now see, he didn't say that all these other times, but he said he's done this every time because he said, I'm going to do the same thing I've done before. So every time he got up, he would get out. Now I don't know what it means to shake yourself other than it means to shake yourself. Okay, I don't know what it means. But I kind of picture those WWE guys. You know how they get all worked up and slap their faces and all that kind of stuff to get pumped up. But now the, the New Testament corollary of this would be when Paul said, stir up the gift that's in you. That's what he was doing. He stirred up the Spirit of God. Alright? Now watch this. And he wist not, that's Old English for he knew not, and he knew not that the Lord was departed from him. So now you get the picture. Now there's several things to realize here and look at. <clears throat> but now, it said he didn't know that the Lord was departed from him. And he said, it's going to be like it was before. Every other time, I'm going to get up, I'm going to go outside, I'm going to shake myself, and then I'm going to kill some Philistines. And he got up. Now, now, you would th now follow with me here. He gets up. He goes outside, apparently he shakes himself, and then he would just plow right into the Philistines. That's what he did every time, right? Now, 
It said he didn't know that the Lord had left him. So that means that he didn't know that what we generally would call the anointing wasn't there. Now that means that the anointing is what you would generally call the anointing. Remember we talked about that today, what the anointing is. What is it? But what, we, what people generally call the anointing, that means that the, what we call the anointing doesn't have a feeling. Because if, if it had had a feeling, if when every time he shook himself, he felt something, then he would have known when he didn't feel it. Right? But he didn't know that the Lord had left him. So that means there was no feeling when the Lord was gone or when the Lord was there. And it said he was going to do the same thing he does every time. Every time. That means every time he went out, he went out and shook himself and he never felt it. Because if he would ever felt it, this time he would have known he didn't feel it. And he would have known the Lord was gone. And he would have shook himself and said, I'll be with you in just a minute. You guys, you hang, hang, hang on. I'll just hang on a second. Lord, what's going on here? I'm not, now, can, can y'all come back a little bit later on? I, it's going to take a little bit. I'm going to have to pray through on this one. I can tell. It's going to be hard. You see, but he didn't do that. That means that, he, that the anointing, or that as we call it, he, it never had a feeling. He never felt anything. Amen? That's what that means. Now, here's another proof that he didn't feel anything. If I go over to Hebrews chapter 11, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32 says, now you know in Hebrews 11 they recite all the heroes of faith and they talk about different people and name people and they keep saying by faith, by faith, by faith. Okay. Then in verse 32, it says, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson. So Samson is mentioned as a man of faith. Right? Which means that every time he went out, he never felt anything. Every time he stepped out in faith, not at feeling anything and not going by feeling. He didn't walk by sight or by feeling. He walked by faith. He walked based on the belief that God was with him. And he stepped out not knowing the difference. And you say, but Jesus said he felt virtue grow So there is a feeling associated with it. No, there can be, but there doesn't have to be. Right? The problem is usually we wait for the have to be. We wait for the feeling, and when it's there, we think it's there. And when we don't feel it, we don't think it's there. Right? Now, I brought all that up to, to say this. When we first start, when I first started, I was, first off, I was in a, an Assembly of God church. And I've been going there for a while, and I just wanted to do anything I could do. I just wanted to help. And I told the pastor, I'll do anything you want. You want me to be a door greeter? I'll greet at the door. I'll be an usher. What, you just, what do you need me to do? And they put me in different positions, and I would just fill in wherever I needed to, to help. So I've been there a while, and finally I, I told him, I said, because I've been studying and reading, and I said, Pastor, I, I'd like to teach a class here if you don't mind. And he said, well, okay. And he said, well, what class do you want to teach? And I said, well, I don't know. I figured something just basic. Let's just start with you know, like basic Bible doctrines. And he said, well, all right. He said, why don't you take a Thursday night class? When we have classes, they're on Thursday night. We don't have any going right now, so you just take a Thursday night class. I said, okay. So he announced it, and we had registration, and everybody came in there on Thursday night. And we had probably, we probably had 20 people, you know, which is a good turnout for basic Bible doctrines. Because, you know, honestly, basic Bible doctrines is probably one of the deadest classes you can teach, right? So we were doing good to have them in there. But one of the rules was to come to the class, you had to be a member of the church. That was just the way they had it set up. So first night, now this was before I was really preaching at all. I mean, I wasn't used to preaching. I had, I mean, it was, you know, I wasn't preaching anywhere. Nobody was asking me to preach or anything. And so, which is probably a good thing because I really didn't have a message. <clears throat> Worst thing a preacher can do is preach when he doesn't have a message. Yeah. Amen? So... I go in, I teach this class. I had this book. I, it was actually put out by the Assemblies of God called Bible Doctrines. 
And the first lesson was the Word of God as our final authority, and, and it just says, you know, we got to go by the Word. Okay. Started teaching that. Got in about 35 minutes, 25, 35, 40, right through there. And all of a sudden, because I wasn't used to preaching a long time, my voice started going out. I mean, it's like, <clears throat> and I started drinking water. All right, now, <clears throat> and just going out, just wasn't used to it. So I said, all right, we're going <clears> to <throat> cut the class short tonight, and we'll, we'll see y'all next Thursday. So we went to next Thursday, about the same number, no big deal, no increase, but nobody left either, so we were doing okay. So we come back in, teach second class, still rough. My boy, 30, 45 minutes, my voice is going out. <clears throat> Drinking as much water, still it's going like this in time. I'm sorry, I'm just, you know, <clears throat> just not used to it because I was, you know, breathing through my mouth too much and, and I still don't know how to do it right, but, you know, now I just built up endurance, okay? And so, third week, I think it was uh, the, what was it, yeah, the, the, um, the, oh, it was on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I come in there and, and I, well, when I come into the first, that Thursday night, the third one, that night I was going to teach on the baptism of the Holy Ghost and nobody, you know, nobody really knew anything what I was going to teach on. But this other guy came to me who was a preacher and he'd been sitting in the classes. He goes, Brother Kerr, I noticed your voice keeps going out. I said, yeah, just not used to preaching in a long time. And he said, well, you know, I don't know if you know this old preacher's trick or not, but I can tell you how to keep your voice going. I said, you know, I don't know, go ahead, what do, what do you got? And he said, well, if you take this Sudafed, then it will basically close off the capillary thing and, and, it, and it, you can keep preaching. And I thought, I ain't never heard of nothing. Because I really don't take medicine. I don't do that kind of stuff. So I had no idea. I'm like, really? Sudafed? That's crazy. I never heard it. He said, yeah, I brought you some. If you want some, I'm like, okay. So I get ready to open up the class and I'm like, oh yeah, I better take the Sudafed, drink some water. All right, <clears throat> let's go. Tonight we're going to teach on the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You need the power of the Holy Ghost. You need that baptism of the mighty power of the third person of the Trinity. You need the power of the Holy Ghost. And I'm preaching in about 35 minutes into it. Right? I'm talking about how that baptism is an anointing of power. And all of a sudden I'm like, glory to God, I can't feel my fingers. <laughs> Whoa, he's here. I can tell. He's... Can't feel my legs from my knees down. It's the Holy Ghost. Everybody get up. We're going to pray for you right now. While it, hey, you got to pray while the anointing's on you. Right? They all line up. We turn, we, I think the lights were down a little bit. And we put on some music from Pensacola from the revival. You know, yes, Lord, we will ride with you. And I was going through there. Had a young man there with me. And I'm walking through there and I'm laying hands on It was amazing. I'm laying hands on people like, be free. And just, Wah! They just fall down. And I'm like, yeah, glory to God. <laughs> Ooh, this is good. You know, can't feel any of my fingers. I'm like, whoo, whoo, this is good. And we go through, we're just laying hands on it. They're falling on top. I mean, just piled up. Ew, I'd never seen anything like it. And I'm going through there. And you ever see the movie Apocalypse Now? You ever seen that one? He's, Robert Duvall is walking on the beach. Doesn't have his shirt on. Got the, the drill sergeant type hat on. And he's walking through there. And they got bombs going off. And they're surfing. Right? And he's walking through, and he goes, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. <laughs> you know, just guts it. That's why I felt. I'm like, yeah, bless God, put somebody under my hands, quick. <laughs> and I'm walking through there, and I mean, we go through it. Be healed, be free, be set free. Just, Phew. so we go out of there, and I, I go home, and I'm like, yeah, this is a good night. And by the time I get home, it's like, well, the anointing has lifted. It's okay, all right? So we go on. Next Sunday, I'm sitting on the front row, and the pastor, because I have to put out a report what all happened. And Pastor England, he's a good southern boy, talks kind of slow, got that draw, and he's like, well, I don't know what's going on in that Bible doctrine class, but we had 14 healed, 13 rededications, four deliverances. You know, and I'm sitting on the front row, and I'm like, yeah, coach, put me in. I told you, we can do this thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know? We're going to get this thing done, you know, because I was, I was happy. And so everybody heard about it. So the next Thursday, class doubled. Everybody wanted to come in and see what was going on. So I'm feeling pretty good. I'm like, yeah, double class. This is true. Yeah, that's the way it's supposed to work. So I'm fixing to open up and start teaching. And I'm like, oh, better take that Sudafed. It worked last time. <laughs> so I had it up there. So I took another Sudafed, took some water. Tonight we're going to talk about 
the initial evidence of the baptism of the Spirit, which is speaking in tongues. And so I start talking about what tongues do. And you need baptism tongues. And you need speaking tongues. And it's the power of God and glory to God. He's back. <laughs> Can't feel my hands. It's amazing you start talking about the Holy Ghost. He just shows up. It's great. I'm like, you know the drill. Everybody get up, get against the walls, line up. And do what we're going through. <laughs> right out the report. Sunday, we're talking about it again. Everybody's coming in. And brother... Brother England came to me. Oh, Brother Curry, I tell you what. That, we have never had people join the church just so they can go to a Bible doctrine class. <laughs> you know, I, I'm feeling pretty good. And so, he gives the announcements and everything next Thursday night. Well, the next Thursday, that preacher that gave me the Sudafed came up to me and said, Oh, Brother Curry, uh, notice your voice seems to be doing pretty good. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's working. He goes, so, but are you noticing any other side effects? <laughs> no, what are you talking about? He said, well, you know, some people can't take Sudafed. I'm like, why? Oh, it does stuff to them. They can't feel their fingers. <laughs> and I'm sitting there and I'm like, hmm, do tell, really. And I'm thinking all this inside, and I'm thinking nobody will ever know this. I will never tell a soul, okay? <laughs> but now, and that night, let me tell you, class was short that night. Because I'm thinking, people really got healed. People really got blessed, really got delivered. I'm, I'm like, God. So I'm like, all right, here's a, here's a lesson. Went through it. All right, God bless you. Good night. See you next week. Bye. And I was out of there because I wanted to get along with God. And I started asking God, God, what's going on? Was that... Was that you or was that Sudafed? Remember? Remember the old commercial? Is that real or is it Memorex? Remember that? And so God started talking to me about it. And he said, what happened was you were always anointed. But you were waiting for a feeling to feel anointed. And when you got a feeling, you started acting anointed. And when I started acting anointed, it started working. But it wasn't the feeling that was the anointing. He knew not that the Lord had departed him. The anointing has no feeling. Right? Now, you say, then how come there's times when I feel it? Okay, there's a difference between feeling the anointing, because I told you today what the anointing is, and that's different. But there is a feeling associated with the presence. Okay? The presence of God can be felt, and the presence of God can be felt on people that are not even born again. Right? So there is a, a presence, but presence doesn't always get people healed. Right? And our problem is we want to fill the place with the presence, hoping that God will do the work that He's commanded us to do. Now, He heals. Alright? You understand? We don't heal. No, but let me explain this to you. In the Bible, it talks about the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if I don't go, I can't send the Spirit back. And he said, if I go, though, I will send another helper, another comforter. And if you look up the word used there, it is the Greek word parakletos. All right? Now, parakletos is not two old boys from Arkansas. You know, parakletos is, you know what I'm talking about? Here's, Cle you know, here's my brother Cletus, and here's my other brother Cletus over here. It's not talking about, it's talking about, para means beside, right? And Cletus means helper. Literally, I'm just a simplification. But literally what it means is paraclete means literally one called alongside to take hold of together with and against. Now I know that's a long thing. Basically what it says is the Holy Spirit is a helper whose job is to come along beside you in a manner of speaking and help you, take, take hold of the situation with you and help you. Alright? Now, here's our problem. We keep trying to change positions with God. We keep trying to be... We keep trying to help God. Well, you know, we're going to make it easy on God. We're going to do this, and we're going to do it, and we're going to help God. Okay, God don't need help. You need help. Right? The, the Holy Spirit is the helper. Now, James 1.22 says, Be doers of the word, not just hearers. Right? So who's the doer of the word? We are. Right? We're the doer. Now, if we're the doer... That means that the Holy Spirit is our helper. Right? Because He's the helper. Now if He's the helper and we're the doer, we got to quit changing it around and trying to, be, trying, trying to help the Holy Spirit be the doer. You understand? 
the Holy Spirit is the helper to help us do the Word. We do the Word and He helps us by what? Go with, go with me to Mark. Let's go to Mark 16. Mark 16. <clears throat> At the end. <clears throat> In verse 19 it says, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, He was re received up into heaven sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with and confirming the word with signs following. Now, notice, He is a helper. Now see, what you need to do is you need to get more of a spirit kind of like Elijah. Right? Prophets of Baal are out there jumping around. Right? And, and He says, go ahead, you do it first. And so they build this big pile of wood and they're going to have to try to get this big fire going because the God who answers by fire is going to be the one everybody follows. Right? It was a contest between God and the pro or between Elisha and the prophets of Baal. So they build this big wood bonfire thing. No fire, just the wood. And then they start jumping around, bouncing around, screaming, hollering, doing everything. The Bible even says they started cutting themselves to try to get their God, Baal, to answer by fire and to light the bonfire. And then Elijah is sitting over there making fun of them. I'm, and now see, we wouldn't think that was polite. But he was over there making fun of them, saying, well, uh, why don't y'all shout a little louder? Maybe your God's hard of hearing. <laughs> then he started saying, well, maybe your God has gone on a journey. Maybe he's on vacation. And, he said, and actually, at one point, he even said, maybe you need to yell a little louder because maybe your God is in the toilet. <laughs> That's what it is. Read it. That's what it said. It says he was in the toilet. And so they jump louder and they do it all day long. Now, to be honest with you, kind of sounds like the modern church. If we get loud enough, jump enough, shout enough, run around enough, get enough stuff going, if we get it enough going on, maybe God will show up. Isn't that right? The only thing we hadn't done for the most part is going to cutting ourselves. Right? And I'm not too sure that hadn't been happening somewhere. And we need to rest. But now Elijah's sitting on there and he says, All right, when you boys get tired, you sit down and I'll show you how this is done. Then whenever they sit down, they get ready. He walks over there and says, All right, first thing we're going to do is I want you to go get barrels of water. Bring all the barrels of water you can find and pour it all over the wood. Why? Because we ain't going to make this easier on God. We're going to make it harder. And I'm going to show you of a fact that when this happens, it's God and not man. And they right? What do we do? We do just the opposite. We're going to try to get every... Now, and I... I I have to be careful or I'll name names, right? But there are books out there that talk about, well, when the pattern is right, the power will fall. If we get it all just right, if you get it all lined up, get everything just right, get it perfect, and everything, you do, you get everything. when you get the pattern right, then God can come in. Like he's some spoiled rock star. I refuse to perform until I get my green M&Ms. I want green M&Ms, and until everything's just right, I am not going to perform. And we act like God is like that. Right? Now, the bad part is, we'll try to get everything set up. Now, I'll be honest with you. I don't, I don't mean this disrespectful, but I don't need a God who shows up when everything's perfect. I need one that shows up when everything's wrong. I need one that shows up when all hell breaks loose in my life. You understand? Not when I'm doing everything just perfect and just right and everything is perfect. You understand? I need a God who is a sure help in a time of trouble. Not one that might help when I get it right. But what do we do? We spend all of our time trying to make sure that we're right so that God can help us. We're trying to help God. We're not God's helper. The Holy Spirit is our helper. You understand that? I know this is going to, you know, grate against some of you. But I got scripture. All right? Mark 16. They went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them. Them is not there in the Greek. But working with and confirming the word with signs following. Now, let me ask you this. Now, we know, and let me be clear, no human can heal a sick person. Are we clear? Right? No human can heal. Now, so if that's the case, who heals? Jesus, or we would say the Spirit of God. Right? So the Spirit of God heals. So the Spirit of the God is... Spirit of the God. 
starting to talk like Indonesians. That's what they do. You, you serve the God. Yep. Yes, I do. I serve the God. And so, when I notice, the Spirit of God, it, we are the doer of the Word. The Spirit of God does the work. Right? But if we do the Word, He helps us do the Word by doing the work. Right? So He helps us by doing His part. We are co-laborers together, workers together with Him. Isn't that right? So, now, but I want you to understand, and I'm not being disrespectful, Jesus said, I will send you another helper. Okay? I didn't, I didn't demote the Holy Spirit. Jesus put Him in that position. Right? Now, so, let me get this straight. We got the believer who is supposed to do the Word. Right? Then we have the Spirit who is supposed to help us. Right? Now, He helps us do the Word by Him doing the work. We lay hands, He heals the sick. Right? Now, what happens first? Does He heal the sick and then we lay hands on them? Or do we lay hands on them and then He heals the sick? Okay. So we got to do the Word before He can help us. Right? Okay. The Lord working with and confirming the word with signs following. Now notice the signs. Okay, go back up to verse 17. And these signs. So these are the signs in verse 17 that's being referred to in verse 20. Right? And these signs shall follow. Oh, see, signs follow, signs following, same wording. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them, as another shall not hurt you, okay? And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So if I lay hands on the sick, I'm laying hands, and the sign that's supposed to follow is they recover. Right? Now, who makes them recover? The Holy Spirit, right? So he is working with and confirming the word with the sign of laying, when I lay the hands, he confirms the word, confirms me doing the word, right? Or speaking the word, either one. And he confirms that by him doing the recovering. So I'm doing the work, he's doing, I'm doing the word, he's doing the work, and he's causing the recovery. And if I do that, I lay hands first, and then I step over, or whatever it is, and then he steps in and does the job and heals them. Is that right? Okay, so I do my part first, and then he does it. Right? I'll say it again. I do my part first, then he does his part. Yeah. Right? Now, let me ask you this. <clears throat> Who's following who? So I'm not following the Spirit. He's following me. Well, I, but we should be led by the Spirit. No, you should be led by the nature and character of God. You understand? Now, being led by the Spirit means that you're being led by His nature and character. And now, I'm not saying He can't show you specific things to do and all that. That's a special leading. But special means not normal. The normal leading is you decide to believe the Word of God and do the Word of God. And then whenever you do, He confirms it by following you around. Signs follow the believer. The Holy Spirit does a sign. The believer does the work. The Word, right? So the Spirit's following you. If you don't lay hands, people can't get healed. Right? Well, if God wants to heal me, He don't need a man's hands to do it. No, He doesn't. But He chose to. Well, God can do it any way He wants. No, He can't. You won't let Him. He said He wants to do it by laying on of hands. And you're saying He has to do it some other way. Why don't you just submit to God and say, God, if you want to have somebody lay hands on me to heal me, that's fine. You see what I'm saying? We just need to work with God. Now, the reason I brought this up is because I want to explain two things to you very quickly. One is, if I was an electrician, certified whatever it is, right? I'm not, but if I was. And let's say I come up here, and while I was here, pastor said, Brother Curry, while you're here, I know you're, I understand you're an electrician. I'm like, yeah. Well, man, we've been having some wiring problems. You, you think you might find some time to do a little work on the church for me? Well, yeah, no problem. Right? Now, if I'm a certified electrician, for me to do the work, if, I'm, if that's my job, then I'm probably going to have somebody with me. Right? He's my... Helper. Yeah. Now, according to state law, do you realize that I have to do the work? Right? Helper can't do the work. I'm the certified. I'm the one that is certified to do the work. The helper can help me, but I can't say, okay, you do this, and I'm going to go take lunch, and when I come back later, you know, I'm going to look at it. Okay, that's not legal. 
right? I have to do it and my helper helps me. And he is learning the trade, so to speak, or whatever. Now, we come in here and I say, okay, these are the length of the walls. And, and, and I say, I'm going to need the tall ladders. And I'm gonna need, we're going to need this gauge of wire. And, and he's walking around with me. And if we've worked together a lot, he's going to look for things. And I'm going to be looking for things. And he's going to be writing this stuff down. I'll say, okay, we're going to need three rolls of wire. We're gonna, okay, three rolls. He's writing it down, right? And then as I walk around, I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to need the conduit going this way. Okay, conduit forward. Okay, put that down. And, he, and I'll say, okay, I'm going to need the joints right there. Okay, right there. Put that in. Now, and if he's a good helper, anything I miss, he's going to say, oh, yeah, what about that right there? You're going to, you want to use these? Oh, yeah, I'm glad you saw that. Okay, put that there. Why? Because he's a good helper. That means he watches and he picks up anything I miss. Right? Because he's a good helper. Now, the more we work together and the more we know each other, the smoother we flow together. Right? Now, kind of like a nurse and a doctor. You ever see a nurse and a doctor? They can be working and the, the, if the nurse is a good nurse working with the doctor and they've been together a while working, the nurse is not really looking at what the doctor is doing. She's looking at what he's going to do next because she's done it before. You know, she's been with him. And if she's a good helper, then whatever he needs something, she's going to be looking and he's going to turn to ask for it. If she's good, it's already there. She's going to put it in his hand, poof, right back in there, right? And even before he asks, it'll be there. Isn't that right? So we go on around, we get all this stuff together, and I tell him, all right, put everything out. When I get back, I'm going to run downtown, get us some food, I'll come back. When I come back, we'll eat, and then we'll get busy. He says, okay, I'll go back. When I come back, if he's a good helper, he has everything laid out in the place where we will need it when we need it. Isn't that right? Now, the Holy Spirit is a good helper. He can't do the work. It's not legal for him to do the word. You understand? I got to do the word which allows him to do the work. Right? I'm the one that's commissioned to do the work. He is commissioned to be the helper. We need to quit trying to help the Holy Spirit. Because now both of us are acting like helpers and nothing's going to get done. So you need to quit acting like a helper. Start being the doer of the word that you're commanded to be. And let him help you do the word. Amen? Now as you go around. As, a, as we get a healing line up here. And let's say it was me doing all the, the ministry. And I would start down at one end. I'd go across. And as I went, as I got to each person, you know, he's, he's not ahead of me. He's behind me. He's following me. You understand? Because i got to lay hands and he has to do the signs following. So as I go down, but the, he's right there with me. He's watching. And when I take this person by the hands, guess what? He knows what they need. He's already looked down the line. He knows what each one of these people need. Isn't that right? He knows what you need. He knows exactly what's going on. And as I put my hands out, then guess what? Before I put my hand, when you start to take my hands and we start to hold hands to pray, before that gets there, as you start to put your hands out, he puts in my hand what you need. Do you understand? He will put in my hands what I need that will meet your need. you understand what I'm saying? So it's not a matter of what I can do. It's not a matter of what anybody can do. Now, years ago, I was in Georgia, as a matter of fact, and we were there starting to work there. And I hate to waste time. I hate to, you know, I'm on the road a lot. When I'm home, I like to make use of it. Saturday morning, my wife, my daughters, they all wanted to go to the mall. So I take them out there. They had to do, you know, exchange some clothes or something. I don't know what else. So, you know, women don't buy clothes. They just rent them. You ever notice that? And then they exchange them. You know, anyway. But we go to the mall. And I'm, I'm out there, and, and I get to the car, and we're starting to go into the mall. And so I start looking for a book, because if I'm going to be at the mall, I want something to read, because I hate to waste time, so I'm thinking I'm going to be waiting on them, so I want a book to read. Couldn't find nothing. Okay, it's Saturday morning. I'm wasting time. I don't like it. I don't even have a book to read. So now I'm getting upset. I'm, I'm standing out there. They're in line. Where it seemed like we're there forever. And I'm standing, and I'm getting more upset by the minute. Because I don't like to waste time. And I have no, I'm just standing there. I'm thinking, now listen, the only reason I'm telling you this is I want you to know that I wouldn't be in spiritual. All right? I wouldn't stand in there praying in tongues and singing psalms. All right? I was standing there grumbling and complaining. All right? <laughs> Same thing that made the earth open up and swallow up 50,000 Israelites in one day. That's what I was doing. All right? So I was not being spiritual. Now, so I'm standing there and I'm thinking, bless God. And so I'm thinking, where's a bookstore? I'm going to go buy a book. Just so I can stand here and read something. So while you're standing, you ever notice when somebody walks up in your peripheral vision, you don't really look at them, but you know they're there? 
And you, you can kind of see them, but you don't look. Well, these three women walked up. Two women and a young girl, about 16, I guess. She walks up. They're standing on the side. And all, I'm just standing there. And all of a sudden, I feel something. I don't always feel something. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. It doesn't matter. But I felt something the size of my hand. Right here on my side, which is kind of weird anyway. But it was going out that way. So I felt it. And it was almost like a water hose, just kind of like, whew, I could feel it. So I turned to look and see where it's going. And there's this girl standing there. And you can tell she's standing there. She's, you can tell she was sick. She didn't feel good. She just standing there. And I'm looking and I'm thinking, okay, this is weird. This hadn't happened a lot. I've been asking God, God, let's do some weird things. Let's un abnormal. Let's do some things that just aren't normal. And then God starts doing them. And you start saying, is that you, God? Is that you? You, know, you don't even believe your own prayers. You know what I'm saying? And so it's going out, and after like two minutes, now I didn't, I didn't go over and pray for her. I didn't want to. I was, I was not in a good mood. I was murmuring and complaining and blah, 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 right? So I'm just standing there, but I am smart enough to agree with it, right? So I'm like, yeah, okay, that's, I know that's virtue, power, what do you want to call it? going out and And like two minutes, this girl goes, Mama, I, I feel good. Let, we can go to this place, start naming some place good. And so now you it's kind of like, well, now you want to walk over to him and go, let me tell you what happened. The anointing of God was coming out. And here, you know, but it's too late now, right? So I'm just standing there. I'm thinking, okay, that's weird. That's pretty different. So I, we go home. Like the next day or so, I was sitting at home. I had this little television with a VHS thing in it. And I had a tape in there that somebody sent me a tape from Africa of a healing service. And this healing service was a year, had already been accomplished a year. The tape was a year old. Right? So anything on that tape had already been done. Right? So I put this tape in, turned down the volume because I was writing on my laptop, and all of a sudden, just writing, no sound, not looking, I felt what I felt here, but I felt it right here, and it was like as big as both hands. And it was just going up toward the TV. And so I'm writing and I feel it. Now, I don't feel stuff a lot. Okay? I never cared to. I told God, I don't care what I feel. I don't care if I see anything. I want to operate in pure faith. And if that's necessary for me not to see anything or feel anything, so be it, because that would be greater faith. So, but I started feeling some stuff. So it's going toward the television. So I'm right, and I stop and look up. Right when I look up, there's a young boy on this video that has this huge tumor. It's a, it's a cancer tumor outside of his body. And right when I looked up, it went and just bleh. I mean, it's gross, all right? And this goo was all over me. It was, just, it was really gross. And I'm looking at that. And I'm thinking, what is this? You know? and so I just, I just have a habit of just stopping and going, Lord, what is that? Have you ever noticed Jesus never answered a question except with another question? Isn't that right? And that's exactly what he did. So I said, what is that? And the first thing he said was, what, happen have, have, what happens whenever... Well, first off, he said, have you ever been involved in a life-threatening situation? Well, yeah. A lot of times. He said, what happens when you start talking about it? And I said, well, if I talk about it, the, the more detailed I get, the more I relive it. And if I get detailed enough and really start to relive it, my heartbeat will speed up, my, my breathing will get shallow, and my blood pressure can go up. And, and now it's not actually happening. I'm just reliving it. Right? And he, that's when he stopped and he said, that's what's happening. I thought, what is that? Because I had nothing to do. I didn't know that kid. I didn't know that it wasn't one of my healing services. It was another whole thing. This is what he told me. He said, the Spirit of God is remembering when he healed that boy. But I felt it. Why? Then I said, God, you got to give me scripture. I want scripture for that. This is weird. I want scripture. He quoted a scripture to me I have preached on many times. But I always emphasized one part. I, I emphasized the last part. He emphasized the first part. He said, If that same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he will quicken your mortal body. Right? I always preached on him quickening your mortal body. 
He emphasized the first part. And he said it over and over again. He said, if that same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Stop. Zzz, right back. If that same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Zzz, right. I mean, just over and over. And finally I got it. The same spirit that healed that boy is the same spirit that's in me. Even though I wasn't there. Then it started getting me. Well, wait a minute. The, what he's quoting me is that the spirit that's in me raised Jesus from the dead. Then I started realizing, ha, has any human ever healed the sick? No. We talk about Wigglesworth, this. We talk about John Lake doing this. No, no, no. It wasn't any of them. It was always the spirit. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead in Wigglesworth did it. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead in John Lake healed the people. Isn't that right? And then I started realizing, because I've always had, people always tell me stuff like, well, you know, I just don't know what to do, and I've never been in that situation. That's okay. He has. Matter of fact, he's been in every situation. There has never been a healing that he didn't do. There's never been a situation that he wasn't in. Do you, under, do you get what I'm saying? The spirit that's in you has done every healing, every dead raising, everything that's ever happened miraculous, the Spirit in you did it. And, the, and you're worried about being ready. <clears throat> As if you could actually do it. You understand? And when I realized that, I realized, you know what? There ain't nothing I can walk into that we can't beat. Because he's been, I don't know what's going on, he does. And he will, he, he will take care of the situation. So quit trying to get ready. Quit trying to become and just be who Christ made you to be. He's not, he's not adding to you. He's not, he, you are. You're not a, remember, you're not a new evolution. You didn't evolve into the Christian God wants you to be. You're a new creation. You were created in the Spirit. Who God wanted you to be. You were, you were created perfect and complete in Him. Amen? It doesn't say you're completely in Him. It says you are complete in Him. If it said you were completely in Him, that just means you're all in Him. But when it says you're complete in Him, that means there ain't nothing in you lacking anything that He expects you to do. You get it?